Okay, uh, thanks. I have to start off with uh, my financial disclosures, um, all very exciting, uh, I'm sure, to everyone. And uh, also uh, mention that I won't be uh, uh, recommending any specific drugs. And the additional disclosures that I have to give are that I don't actually own very much stock of any of these companies. It's for my kids' education. So I don't think you have to worry about my massive uh, things uh, really affecting my uh, presentation. Um, so as Dr. Nelson mentioned, the drugs that we have now, uh, which are uh, drugs from three different classes uh, and really four different mechanisms of action, are working incredibly well. And in fact, I think they're working so well that uh, really these are the only drugs we're going to ever end up with. Three, uh, three classes, three targets uh, for the drugs to work on and four main classes. And the response rates we've seen uh, uh, are, are great, over 95% uh, sustained virological response. And it leads to a very reasonable question that I was uh, asked to address, and that, and that is whether uh, HCV drug resistance will matter in this sort of situation. And ironically, I think the answer is, of course it will. Uh, uh, you know, our experience with everything ever has been that we, <laughs> we treat people with drugs eventually we come up with problems with drug resistance. Um, in the absence of a vaccine, I think the exact same thing is going to happen in hepatitis C, is in fact happening now with hepatitis C. It's not affecting huge numbers of patients, but it is, it is a thing. It is affecting a small minority of patients, and therefore it's actually important, and it does matter. And the reason that it matters particularly is that this is the only reason to fail therapy that is actually a transmissible reason to fail therapy. And HIV, HCV drug resistance is something that's a bit of a ratchet. You, you are exposed to the, the medications, you get a little resistant, you get a little more resistant, you might pass that on to someone else, and, and it becomes something that accumulates over time and tends to be an irreversible process. So we in the, the state area of drug resistance actually come up over and over again with this thing that we see from the pharmaceutical world where we see there tends to be initial statements that there's no drug resistance and then, there, okay, there is some drug resistance, but it really doesn't matter. Okay, there's some drug resistance, but it's incredibly rare. And then finally we come to this sort of acceptance that there is some drug resistance, it matters, uh, and we need, need to think about it. And, you know, if you're in, in our, my field of work, we don't actually think about treatment success. The only thing we think about is the treatment failure. So we, you know, we see 95, 97% success rates. I see the 3% glass half full, 3% full, and that's the sort of way I approach things. It's great for a sort of pessimistic person. That's the way we approach things. We only look at the failures, and in fact, I don't think that we should display the results in terms of percent success. We should display our results in terms of the percent not SVR. And it, you know, you look at 96 and 92, they look exactly the same. You look at four versus eight, that's a doubling of failure rate. And I, know, I think that's something that, that is the way I prefer to look at things. What we do in our labs uh, to look at drug resistance is actually a little complicated because what we actually do is pull the virus out of plasma and directly sequence the virus. And we find all these positions throughout the genome and detect mutations. So for example, mutations we might run, run mutation we refer to might be called Q80K. The Q is the, the in green is the wild type. That's the, the amino acid that's supposed to be there if, you're, if you have uh, a completely untreated virus that's, that's happy. The 80 is the position in the protein that we're talking about, and the K is what it's changed to. In this case, Q80K uh, is associated with slightly decreased som somepravir susceptibility. Um, but the effects of the mutations actually can be, can be quite different. Sometimes there can be very large effects, sometimes there can be fairly subtle effects. Um, but what you do tend to see is that if you get this accumulation of more and more mutations, you tend to get higher levels of resistance, and you also try, tend to get broader resistance within the drug class. You tend to get not just resistance to drug X, but you know, over and over as you accumulate more and more mutations, you might actually blow up the, the entire drug class. And this is something that we see over and over again when, with, with antivirals, antibiotics. And the point 
I think that's perhaps the most important is that the resistance we're talking about is resistance to a drug or a class and not a regimen. So you can have complete drug resistance, but you won't see it necessarily because you, the other components of your regimen are actually suppressing the viral load. But you might still have resistance to drug X. So a lot of people will say there's no resistance because everybody's succeeding. Well, there may be resistance, we just didn't see it. Um, and the, the two ways that the sequencing is done, there's actually two different uh, technologies that are used, either standard Sanger sequencing, which is sort of the routine sequencing that people have been doing for years, or deep sequencing, which is a more sensitive analysis that gives you down, uh, down a slightly more uh, uh, um, in-depth look at the population and a quantitative estimate of how much of a, vir of a viral population has a mutation. Um, the thing that's interesting with the deep sequencing is it's got a lower level of detection. So for example, it might have a detection limit of say 10% or 5% or 2% of the virus population that's there. And that sounds like it's a big difference from the Sanger sequencing, but when you think about it in terms of the number of log copies of the virus that are in a body, an average person might be producing say 10 to the 12th copies of HCV. This detection limit, even with our more sensitive deep sequencing uh, methods, is really quite, quite poor. You might still have 10 to the 11th uh, if your virus population is, uh, is a tenth of the total. So what you, what you can see is that really, it probably doesn't matter what detection limit you have. The, the lower your detection limit, the better, so long as you can have good, reproducible, reliable results so that when you say something's there, it really is there. We want to get to the m maximum detection limit for minority species that we possibly can. Um, so how do we know? There's, there's loads of positions and loads of mutations, and, and we, we first of all need to figure out which mutations actually matter for predicting a response. There's really three ways to do this. One is to do in vitro culture and look at the phenotypic effect, see, if the, see what happens when you put a virus in a known backbone and see what happens to the drug's susceptibility. Um, there's also associations with virological failures. You can see patients, for example, with a higher proportion, a higher proportion of the people before they start therapy may have a mutation that in the failures than in the successes. And that's a good flag that there's something important with a given mutation. And there's also selection after virological failure. If you see mutations in uh, post-therapy samples that weren't there before treatment, uh, then that's probably a good indication that there's some uh, important uh, mutations in, in the virus backbone. So I'll start with uh, a quick discussion of the NS3, the protease inhibitors, and the resistance to them. And we can see that there's, about, there's quite a lot of them, um, but although there are a lot of them, there, there tends to be quite a lot of overlap in terms of the patterns of drug resistance. So if you picked up a couple of these mutations, these little, little ticks on the, on the line, uh, you probably have blown up not just the, the, the protease, the NS3 drug that you're on, you've probably had, almost certainly had an effect on all of the protease inhibitors within the class. So looks like we got lots of drugs, but you actually have to divide that by the, the total number that are actually have a different effect. Um, and, and one of the first ones that we had experience was with was with semeprevir. There's one mutation where the arrow is, that's a Q80K change. So it had a small effect on the... Uh, uh, susceptibility to semeprevir, but it, it, it pre-exists in a significant uh, proportion of our genotype 1A population. And it was found that there was this uh, reasonably small of Im impact of this Q80K mutation on response to semeprevir with peg riba. So there was a, a mandated screening for uh, semeprevir uh, susceptibility for at least this Q80K before you go on to uh, drug regimens containing semeprevir. Um, and really what we found is it didn't make much difference. So although clearly the, the, drug, the drug is impacted by having this mutation, when you treated non-serotic patients with uh, 12 weeks of semeprevir, sofosbuvir, you got very good treatment responses. And uh, so that's great. The, you, the, the sort of spin one might take on it is it doesn't matter whether you have this mutation or not then. But in reality, when you treat the uh, serotic patients, you actually see quite a big difference. Uh, uh, change from 
8% failures, I'm inverting your lines for you on the far right, if you have no Q80K, to 26% failures if you do have a Q80K. So this is actually something that matters and it shows that the background in which you're looking at uh, can have a hugely different effect on, uh, on whether you, you are gonna have an impact of a mutation or not. But the semeprevir is just as resistant uh, to the, the drug, the virus, sorry, I'm having a stroke up here. Um, the virus is just as resistant uh, whether you, you're cirrhotic or not. Um, so this made, us, made me look at the, the data that was around for uh, the Abbott compound. And again, if you look in, in the phase two studies of the Abbott compound shown on the, the very far uh, left, you see a 6% failure rate uh, in the people who don't have this Q80K mutation compared to a 12% failure rate uh, in the patients who do have a Q80K mutation. Now that was observed, they, the conclusion was there's no impact of these baseline mutations because that wasn't a statistically significant difference. Although if you take it as a one-sided p-value, it's getting pretty darn close. Um, so I started to wonder and we looked through a little more closely through the uh, the product monograms in, in Canada and the US. And they conclude that when they did a repeat analysis in the phase three studies uh, on a subset of the population, essentially what they found was there's a two-fold higher uh, rate of failure in the people with a baseline Q80K when compared to those who don't. And from that, they conclude that the baseline polymorphism, polymorphisms aren't expected to have a substantial likelihood of achieving SVR. I looked at the same results and I say, well, actually, this just doubled your odds of failure. You went from 69% you know, of the failures have a baseline Q80K compared to 19% of the SVRs. And for me, my conclusion is we'd better screen these guys before we put them on therapy because we care about that 3%, that 2% uh, in the virological world. Those are the guys we care about. We, have, we can have a thousand people we treat. If they all succeed, we don't care about them. Sorry, guys. Uh, we care about the one percent that the, the 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 one guy that doesn't. Now, <laughs> I've just accused FDA and Health Canada of being wrong. And when there's somebody standing up here and saying that Health Canada and the FDA are wrong, it's probably reasonable to suspect that I'm wrong. But it's what I believe. Uh, <laughs> So we'll switch to the NS5A uh, inhibitors. Again, there's actually quite a lot of overlap. There's a bunch of mutations that actually pre-exist in a significant chunk of the population. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of cross-resistance, again, within this class. The interesting thing about these mutations is that they tend to have huge effects on the in vitro susceptibility to the drug. Some of them thousands or tens of thousands of fold shifts in IC50. And that's God's way of saying, you're resistant to the drug if you have uh, these baseline mutations. Um, and so we've seen in uh, the data from uh, the newly approved combination uh, from Merck of Grisepavir and Elbosvir, and they've shown quite a, a, quite a significant difference in response to their drug, whether they have baseline RAVs or not. So the Elbasvir RAVs, shown in the green, had a 2% failure rate uh, if you had none of these uh, RAVs. If you, had, uh, if you had baseline mutations to Elbasvir, the failure rate was, I'm trying to do it in my head, 28%, so quite a lot higher. Uh, than if you didn't have the baseline RAVs. And again, for me, this is one of these things that says, we'd better screen uh, people before we put them on this combination so that we only give uh, the, uh, you know, so that we only target 100% success rate. Um, and they also showed that if you just gave longer therapy, uh, even in prior PI non-responders, you gave 16 weeks uh, of therapy, uh, and, and sometimes in, including ribavirin, they were getting 100% response rates. So again, even, even if you've got these RAVs, there are ways that you can do something different. Now in Canada, uh, uh, in Canada, that the label is the drug is approved in genotype 1A. In the United States, 
uh, the, they actually recommend pre-screening for NS5A resistance before starting this combination. They're also recommending it for uh, Diclatasvir, and I think in reality, we should be pre-screening everybody. So my opinion is that we need to know before you start a therapy whether you have pre-existing NS5A RAVs. So I've just called Health Canada crazy again, and, and I <laughs> don't think that's necessarily the best way for me to proceed, but again, that's what I think. I don't think it's this crazy, but, uh, uh, but um, I, I do think there's even a point, I think the point is that we should also be pre-screening folks who are uh, taking uh, Harvoni-based regimens because there are pre-existing mutations that consist, confer, confer thousands of fold resistance to Lodiposvir, one of the components of the regimen. Um, and uh, it's really hard to tease out from what's been presented whether there are impacts of these baseline RAVs in one or two or a small proportion of the population. But I think we had better know because Again, these mutations are the ones that are going to get passed on to somebody else. We do know that the, the impact of these baseline resistance mutations uh, is, is clearly observable when the, the, the diposvir or cefosprevir regimen is kind of stressed. So if you go for short durations of treatment and you have significant uh, RAVs that are giving like hundreds of fold resistance, your response rate drops by you know, maybe 17% compared to if you have no uh, resistance associated mutations. Same again if you're treatment experienced. So for me, I think we should be doing this. Uh, the, these baseline RAVs uh, actually ex exist in a minority of the population. And I think that they contribute to explaining some of the reason that our 90 to 95% response rates are not 100% response rates. And if we wanna keep our thumb on the uh, emergence of HCV resistance, we have to work at it because these viruses, the NS5A ones, don't go away when you come off the drugs. These are the ones that are likely to be transmitted, transmitted to somebody else. And again, this is, sounds like a doomsday scenario I'm making up, and we'll have no data that we've seen this. Having said that, we have the experience of everything else ever. So I think that's a good thing that we can base it on. Uh, and when you think about it, actually, there's been 200,000 people in, the, in North America treated with soft lead with, say, 95, 97% success rate. That means there's 10,000 people walking around who've got high-level ledipasvir resistance. And you know, maybe a couple of thousand people with resistance to both of them. There's really only one thing that can happen over time as this accumulates and accumulates. Um, the NS... Uh, uh, sorry, the NS5A, I failed this. Uh, sorry, the NS5B inhibitors tend to have less resistance. What's nice about them is there's two classes here, and there's little overlap of the resistance mutations. Uh, I think that the resistance mutations that, we're, that we see in, in the clinic will just uh, continue to arise and we'll get more knowledge about them, but for the most part, I think we don't know enough about uh, the emergence of NS5B resistance, and this will have to be something that, uh, that comes with experience in the, in the clinic. Uh, and I will skip that and just comment that I don't think that necessarily retreatment is, all, is not necessarily always going to work. In Canada, that's probably the case because we're not going to pay for retreatment in a lot of the cases. Uh, but even if you do, there's not a 100% guarantee that people are going to be resuppressed. Um, the, you, you can, for example, if, if we look at the data from people treated with 24 weeks of soft lead after they failed 8 to 12 weeks of, uh, lead, uh, of, of a previous soft lead uh, uh, regimen, their response rates, if they had baseline resistance, was, were down to like 60%. So 40% of our population was fail, failing. And if they had a particularly nasty mutation called 93H, there's even, even worse response rates. So it's not necessarily a slam dunk that we can just retreat everyone and cure everyone. Uh, so I would actually suggest that one thing that we should do is pre-screen patients before we start them on therapy so we know whether they're at elevated risk of, uh, of failure or not. So we're, we're, we're trying to do in our lab is make available, if anyone wants it on a research use only basis, a deep, deep sequence analysis of the whole, essentially the whole genome of HCV 
Uh, we're doing this, you get genotype and subtype information uh, in, uh, from a single amplicon. Uh, the eventual cost will not be that high. It'll be you know, 300 bucks or something like this. When you compare that to the cost of the regimen, I think that this will be a, a, a very useful way of selecting regimens uh, it, uh, uh, that are, are approaching 100% or more if we can do it in terms of response rates. So the vast majority of patients, HCV resistance is not a problem and it's not going to be a problem. But for every DAA treatment failure, the individual who's failed is worse off than when they started. They've got more resistance than when they started and sometimes to multiple classes of drugs. Society is worse off because they're likely to transmit that. And uh, I think that's how HCV drug resistance will actually be uh, important in the future, despite the great success we've had. And I think, I'm not sure if we can take any input from the audience. <laughs> Okay, we have time for uh, perhaps two quick questions. Thank you for the talk, it's very nice. Uh, I have a question, uh, like, is there any relationship now between using or combining the ribavirin with the other uh, regimens on the uh, mutation effect? Um, no, uh, so, so we, we've tried to look at that in sort of uh, clinical trials uh, where folks have been randomized to, to ribavirin and not, and we couldn't actually see anything, any effect of the ribavirin when we looked for it, even in the whole genome. Uh, so I, I don't know what ribavirin is doing. So there's no possibility that ribavirin can increase the, uh, the resistance associated variants? Uh, I mean, not, not directly. I mean, you, you, only through its effect on SVR. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, great, thank you.